This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Volturo, the gold to Bitcoin exchange. Trade gold to Bitcoin instantly and securely, starting at just one milligram. Go to Volturo.com to deposit some Bitcoin and start trading today. And by Shapeshift. With no account or signup required, it's the easiest way to buy and sell gems, Dash, Nubits, Monero, and other leading cryptocurrencies. Go to shapeshift.io to instantly convert your altcoins and to discover the future of cryptocurrency exchanges. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. Uh, we're here today with Dave Hudson. Uh, he's someone we've wanted to have on for a long time. Some of you may know him from the block Hashing It, which is the, the leading or one of the leading blocks about Bitcoin mining. He's written a lot of really interesting stuff there. And he is, he's also the VP of software at Pier Nova, which used to be a mining company. They've sort of pivoted to doing other things in the blockchain Bitcoin space at the moment. And, and previously, he was also uh, working for Qualcomm, which is uh, a big chip manufacturer. And then they've also been sort of involved in the Bitcoin space recently, I think, with the 21 thing, uh, which we can talk about too later. So, uh, uh, Dave, thanks so much for coming on. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. So to get started, tell us, how did you, how did you get into Bitcoin and, and especially how did you become interested in, in writing about mining? Okay, uh, so uh, I, I got interested in Bitcoin uh, by one of the guys I, I currently work with at Pianova. Uh, he and I had worked at uh, another company called Ubicom for quite a number of years. And uh, he had uh, been off and done some other stuff. And then he would actually set up a, a company which was uh, called High Bitcoin. And they were looking at building uh, ASICs for mining. And so he was really interested in the whole hardware design. And he... Uh, Called me one day when I was over in uh, in California and said, "Have you actually looked at this stuff? What what do you make of the technology? Are you interested in doing something with this?" And uh, so I looked at it and I read everything I could find. And this is uh, at the beginning of last year, but beginning of two thousand and fourteen. Uh, and it was just sort of fascinating. I, I looked at this thing and just thought, "This is huge. This this network's vast. Uh, some really interesting ideas." Uh, but I wanted to understand a bit more about it, so. Before I was even going to think about actually going and doing anything in the space, I wanted to understand what the space was about and how it worked. And so I started looking for information about how the core network worked. So you could read the source code, that's fine. And you could sort of see postings from various people about how mining worked. But I started trying to find any in-depth analysis of what was really going on in the mining network, what really worked in terms of... uh, uh, how things were put together and, and, and how they really behaved. And I just couldn't find anything. So uh, I, I'm sort of a bit of an um, analyst in, 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 in sort of most of what I do. I like to have good data and I like to be able to see numbers and actually compare things. So because I couldn't find them, I sat down and started to try and work things out for myself. Yeah, that's true. A lot of when you come into the space, you quickly realize that a lot of the information that's circling around is either opinionated or highly anecdotal and right. having actual statistical an- analysis, I mean, other than just the data that's provided by just the raw blockchain is, is really valuable. Um, can you tell us what are some of the, the metrics that you find the most interesting or some of the core metrics uh, that you're specifically looking at when uh, looking at mining? So I think there's, there's lots and lots of really interesting things. And one of the things I've found fascinating is that um, Every time you look at a different set of data, you can find something new in there that you haven't seen before. Um, and, and I've seen you know, lots and lots of different patterns. Um, and, but I mean, the, the stuff that started me out being interested was looking at things like hash rates. Uh, I had a background in doing uh, semiconductor development as well. And so you know, seeing a technology that had raced through every generation of, you know, all the way from software through to you know, three generations of ASICs via GPUs, in the space of five years was quite amazing. I've never seen anything like that before. So I wanted to really understand what was driving that and understand where those numbers came from and understand you know, what they actually really meant. Um, so the starting stuff I was looking at was hash rates uh, and trying to understand the relationship between hash rates and uh, the technology changes and the amount of money that was involved in exchanges. Some of it was 
pretty good. Some of it early on was pretty wrong. Um, but I was I was trying to understand what actually drove those uh, those hash rate numbers, and where would that ultimately lead the network? So that was well, that was one aspect to it. The second one was to try and understand uh, what it means in terms of who is actually managing and controlling the network, and also to understand how the network's being used. So what are the natures of the transactions? What sort of things are being transacted? Are, are they real transactions? Are they what, what's actually causing these various things to happen? Uh, and then to, to try and understand where that can actually go in the future. So the thing I'm really interested to understand was, or was very interested to understand when I started doing it, was to, to see what happens when the network starts to get full, what happens when uh, block rewards change, and what happens to mining incentives, and what happens to the nature of mining, um, and, and see how that evolves over time. So really, I just wanted to understand how the network can evolve and which ways it could move. And the, and the starting point is to understand the basics of, of what the network does right now. So so the, I agree that those are sort of the tor- two core things related to mining is the hash rate and who's controlling the hashing power. Now, you mentioned basics. So, I mean, I think most listeners will be aware of what hash rates are. But just for the sake of uh, introducing this topic, can you define... What is the hash rate and how it's calculated? Okay, so the, the hash rate isn't directly measured. It's not something you can actually really measure. The best you can do for the hash rate is you can sort of indirectly measure it. And uh, this is something I looked at uh, last year. The, um, the only metric you actually have within the main Bitcoin network is to see the number of actual completed blocks. So you can measure the number of blocks that were actually calculated um, you can see the difficulty that was being applied. You can sort of see what's happening to the difficulty changes. And from that, you can get a gauge as to what the real hash rate is. But of course, it's the nature of Bitcoin blocks is that they're found relatively infrequently. It's you know nominally once every 10 minutes. Um, but that has a huge amount of statistical variability in it. Uh, something that's that random when you're dealing with a nominal 144 blocks in a day can have a huge amount of variance. So... Uh, on a day-to-day basis, the difference in the number of blocks you can find could be plus or minus 20% quite easily. Um, so it's only when you look at things over the longer term you start to get a real picture for what's going on. And so I wanted to understand, you know, what's the variability here and, and what's what can you and can't you safely say about this? And then, you know, look at whether you can actually make some predictions about how things will change over, over time. So uh, fundamentally... With uh, the Bitcoin network, you have what's actually classed as a non-homogeneous or inhomogeneous Poisson process. So uh, a Poisson process is basically modeling random events where each new event, so in, in the case of Bitcoin, each block is uh, statistically uncorrelated with the previous block. So it doesn't matter what the previous one was or how long it took. The next one, the amount of time it takes to find it is pretty much independent of the previous one. And so this leads you to the situation where you can get blocks that are found in very rapid succession, or you can have blocks that take you know, well over an hour uh, to, to find. But the statistical mean is going to be 10 minutes. Is there, are there some phenomena or, uh, or patterns uh, outside of the Bitcoin space in our life that people are familiar with that are ruled or, or by a similar or the, the same statistical process? Yeah, um, in fact, Poisson processes are very, very common. Um, the, the the classic ones that you tend to find people describe are things like radioactive decay. Uh, that's another another example of a Poisson process. Uh, things like uh, the number of phone calls arriving at a call center. Uh, th- there's lots of these sorts of things that actually uh, look like these Poisson processes. And so there's a lot of a lot of uh, mathematical. Um, modeling that's been done for various different domains, and you can use some of those to actually understand what's happening with Bitcoin. Um, I mean, it actually turns out there are some subtleties to Bitcoin that don't make it quite as clean as, as some of these others. There are, are a few subtle interactions, but I don't think anybody's done a great deal of analysis on those yet. I, I think I recall learning about Poisson process and, and statistics in school, but mm-hmm. uh, that was probably one of my worst subjects. So <laughs> it's fair to say I've forgotten about that. Um, so, so we mentioned that you know we and we know that uh, nominally blocks blocks take ten minutes, uh, um, sorry, on average to uh, to to find, and, but that there is quite a bit of variance uh, in that amount of time. Can you talk about that? 
Yeah, so the, the idea is that you have a, an exponential decay function. So um, initially, you know, the, the most likely time to find something is, is basically near time zero. So it's when you start off. And then progressively you find f fewer and fewer um, uh, sort of time intervals. As, as you get a longer time interval, you get less and less probability that that time, particular time will be at the next event. Um, so the actual function is fairly straightforward to, to plot. Um, because it's just a uh, basic exponential decay. The um, in terms of what that what that actually means, though, the, the, there's a, there's a few subtleties for Bitcoin itself. Um, so it is that that model works if you assume that everybody has the same information at the start time, and so everybody starts from the same point. But in fact, in Bitcoin, there are some subtleties that mean that the initial few seconds aren't actually quite as evenly distributed as they should be. So there's a propagation delay time in the network where it takes time for blocks to propagate. And so you have a period of time where not everybody is actually working on the same problem. So even assuming everybody starts on the, from the previous block, it takes a while for them to all see that previous block. So the, the actual curve isn't quite that ideal Poisson process curve. Um, and this is an area I think that needs a little bit more analysis. Uh, I haven't had the time, unfortunately, but it's something that's on my list of things to do. So many will have heard about uh, the idea of propagation, how fast blocks propagate. And one context in which this has come again and has been discussed is, is the block size debate. So the question whether the block size should be increased, we've, we've talked about that quite a few times on the show. You come from this very, I would say, analytical background or analytical approach to looking at Bitcoin, right? looking at the data. So. From that perspective, what is your view about the, the block size question? So I think the biggest problem with the block size debate right now is this, there's a lack of really good data driving it. And I think there's uh, a few things that need, that if, if you could actually sort of plan this as an engineering exercise, there's a few things you'd want to do first. And I, I think the first thing you'd really want to understand is uh, what is the real behavior of the network? So I have seen some work where people have been trying to measure propagation times uh, because that has a that that propagation characteristic has a very profound impact in terms of um, how the network's secured and how fast the miners are actually operating. Uh, there, there's um, a lot of the data seems to be uh, very uh, unreliable in the sense that nobody's really taking into account where the majority of the hashing is right now, and so I think that there's a there's a lot of um, analysis needs to be done in terms of measuring real propagation delays. So you know, if you can get a statistical mean, that's fine, but you actually need to know what the worst case is in certain circumstances. You need to know how well connected all the various miners are and actually try and model what the network looks like and, and, and with the bandwidth that they all have between them, what will actually happen under various circumstances. And it, it's not a hugely complicated model because there's only really maybe a dozen large miners at the moment. Uh, so if somebody could actually model that, I think that would go a huge way to really understanding what changing various characteristics and network would really do to it. Yeah, I mean, I agree, right? It often seems that in the discussion, there's a sort of a, a lot of opinion and, and not a lot of analysis. But given that we don't have that data at the moment, what is what is sort of your personal opinion and your personal view, you know, given the information we currently have, what would happen if the block size was increased to 20 megabytes? So I think 20 megabytes would be a, a, a vast increase, and, and I think it would be probably very unwise to do. Um, I think that there would be problems exposed from doing that, uh, and, and it's sort of a, such a huge step increase. I mean, it's more than an order of magnitude step uh, increase that I think that would be very, very pro problematic, and I don't think the analysis has been done to sort of size that. Um, the truth is that in practice, you know, we wouldn't actually go to 20 megabyte blocks straight away. But what would happen is that if somebody sort of runs a stress test like the ones that have been run recently, that would start to get, um, it would begin, it'd certainly be more interesting. Uh, I, I think you'd see different effects on the network under those circumstances. So I, I think 20 megabytes is a huge change. I think the other thing that's unclear to me at the moment is just how much the real the, the blocks that we have right now are really actually full. So I mean, I, I did some analysis on, on trying to work out just how full blocks were and historically how full they'd actually been based on what miners were really trying to mine. 
Um, so we did some statistical analysis and, and looked at you know, how full those blocks are and what does that mean for uh, transaction propagations. But the big unknown is actually just how many of those transactions that are, were mined into blocks were actually really useful and interesting. And if you started to push up against the limit where the fees went up, how many of those transactions would just simply go away? There were people shuffling coins around or, or just moving things between wallets and, and not really paying, taking much regard for how they did it because there was plenty of space available. I think there's, there's a lot of uh, unknowns there. So, can, can, so what do you mean by like some of these transactions were not uh, of any well, value? The, like the, the, there's a lot of if if you actually look at um, uh, sort of blockchain dot info, they actually have a statistic for some of these now, where you have these sort of so called long chain transactions, where you see things basically moving around in circles almost, um, where you see. So the same, sorry. So the same amount of coins just moving from one address to another. Yeah, and and, and 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 so obviously it's very difficult to do a full analysis of it, but there seems to be a reasonably high proportion of the transactions that have been made to date aren't actually commercial transactions. They're actually simply people moving things around and then moving them back to where they came from in some cases. Yeah, actually, one thing related to that that I was sometimes thinking about. You know, one of the one of the metrics people always talk about when they say, "Oh, Bitcoin is is growing and stuff," is the, is the transaction volume. Of course, let's say you're a, a company like Coinbase or Circle, right? So you you care quite a lot about uh, what Bitcoin is looked at and and if Bitcoin is perceived to have traction. You know, when you mm -hmm. try to raise your next round of venture capital, like that's a chart you're gonna have up there. So how much does it cost to actually? Uh, you know, just just keep on generating pointless transactions to, to show that kind of gradual increase. Probably not very much. So I it's, think it's would not be very much at all. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, even the stress test didn't cost very much. I mean, that was actually one of the interesting things about the, the recent stress test is that the cost for doing that was actually pretty low. And when you're talking about uh, people have an incentive, I mean, a lot of Bitcoin is about incentives. But when you have people have an incentive to see a higher um, transaction volume, it's actually very easy to to create a much, much larger transaction volume. It's time for a word from our sponsors, Voltoro.com, the gold to Bitcoin exchange. Look, if you've ever traded gold with fiat, you know how much of a hassle that can be. Of course, trading gold with Bitcoin makes it super easy and super fast to uh, send money into the exchange. And uh, with Voltoro, you can start trading gold as little as one milligram and their trading fees start at 0.2%. And with the leading, the world leading security and transparency that Voltoro are providing, you can rest assured that your Bitcoins are safe. And by the way, because you're trading commodities, you don't need to provide any KYC documentations for deposits less than $5,000 worth of Bitcoins per day, which means that there's barely any, there are no barriers to entry. You can get started today. You might be asking yourself, what do those guys do all day? Do they lie in their bathtub swimming gold? Well, you might think that, but actually... They may be, may be doing that part of the time, but the other part of the time, they keep doing the same thing over and over again, and that's improving Voltoro. And they've done it again. So this time they've added instant confirmations. They've partnered with BlockCypher, and you can now deposit your Bitcoins and start trading straight away. So keep improving your service. Uh, so go to Voltoro.com and start trading gold today. We would like to thank Voltoro for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So let's talk about this, these stress tests. Can you give a brief context? Um, first, like, what, what exactly happened? Okay, so I mean, I, I, I certainly wasn't involved with those, so I, I've only seen some of the analysis that's been done subsequently. Although this was a thought experiment I, I came up with uh, at the end of last year, beginning of this year, when I was trying to work out what would happen to transaction confirmations if the network starts to congest. And uh, so there's, the idea of the stress test is basically, uh, rather than say, we'll take the normal volume of uh, Bitcoin transactions, what you'd actually do is you would run some period of time where you dramatically increase the number of transactions and see what happens to the behavior of the network. So the interesting thing about the stress test was that the network actually responded exactly like you'd hope it would respond. Um, everything kept working, blocks were absolutely full, uh, nothing failed, some transactions got delayed, especially the ones with lower fees, uh, that they would be delayed because it's in the miners' incentive to um, to take the highest fees that are available. So from that perspective, the, the stress tests were actually extraordinarily positive for the network. They actually demonstrated the network worked really well. And a few people found a few things that broke and they've been able to go and fix those. So it, it's actually been a good thing. And in fact, stress testing is usually a good thing for any engineering system. 
Um, it's just tricky to do in the live system. So, um, but the, the idea is that basically you, you create a large number of transactions, flood the network, um, and see if that will affect the behavior. And in fact, one of the things that, that actually did come out of uh, the biggest one of the stress tests was that uh, we, you saw fees dramatically increase. So, you know, it got to the stage where in order to see transactions really confirm quickly um, and still not, uh, not take you know, many, many tens of minutes or hours to actually confirm, people were actually putting higher fees associated with transactions. So you actually got, a, for the first time, you got a viable fee network uh, and, and, and fees actually being paid to miners. So in this block size debate, one of the vocal points of view has been Mike Hearn, and, and he's been on this show as well to talk about that. And he has argued and written some, some blog posts that have gotten a lot of attention that if the block size is not increased, and if we do have this consistently, uh, you know, because the stress test was only short duration, but if this keeps going on and on and... Uh, that this would lead to basically a disaster with uh, nodes crashing and particularly a bad user experience. I think that's where a, a lot of it comes in, right? Because all of a sudden users send transactions, they don't get confirmed. Uh, you know, they don't know what fee to choose. They might have to like resend it, but how and, and wallets aren't set up to, to do that. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think these concerns are valid? Uh, certainly, some of them are valid. Uh, I think there's no question that bad user experience is is definitely a valid concern, and I think this is something that there's been some discussion um, over the last few weeks about exactly this issue. The problem of not knowing in advance what fee you need to use in order to get your transaction confirmed is, would, would certainly be at least a little counterintuitive to most people. I mean, normally when you when you go to send something to somebody else, you you pretty much know what it's going to cost to send it. If you suddenly discover that actually what you thought it was going to cost is actually not that, it's actually you know three four times that, then it's it's not the most obvious of models. Um, so that that one's sort of a little weird. Um, part of the reason I think that, that that concern exists though is because the network isn't always busy, and so there are times when you can get away with much lower fees. Then nobody's used to paying those higher fees. So the the, the volatility is the bigger problem more than anything else. I think if you actually had a network where the steady state was that you know the fees had to be reasonably large, then it would be unlikely that it would change too much because the cost of running an even bigger stress test would start to go up. Uh, I mean, that's actually one of the problems is that for, for somebody who wants to run those sorts of stress environments is that um, as they push the fees for transactions higher and higher, they're also pushing the fees higher that they need to use in order to stress the network even more. So they're having to pay more to run that test. So uh, I, I, I certainly the, the, there is an aspect where if users aren't sure what the fees need to be, that's, that's not a good situation. And, and that really comes down to the Bitcoin wallets. Um, you know, are the wallets actually able to predict what the fees need to be and actually do that effectively? I mean, just, just one, one thing, one brief point on that. To me, it seems kind of obvious that users should never have to think about the fee, right? Right. Like that. I think the idea that users need to think like, oh, what fee do I need to pay? That's not a good idea. I mean, if yes. you talk about like mainstream adoptions, uh, people will, you know, people will just struggle with that. They won't know what decision to take. Exactly. And uh, if you look at mainstream uh, sort of financial transactions like credit cards, it's it's invariably the recipient pays that fee, not not the sender. I um, mean, it, it sometimes is hidden. Um, and, and sometimes it's an explicit charge, but but generally speaking, the recipient's responsible for, for, for dealing with those fees. Now, and I think the stress test to me demonstrated that uh, there was a a clear risk that Bitcoin could be attacked fairly simply and easily, and perhaps, I mean, most certainly, pretty cheaply. Uh, what did you take away from this? What did you learn, or what do you think that we learned as you know as a, as the as the space? What do you think the learn the what do you think the space learned from this? So I think that the the good things were that you know the network stayed up, it stayed reliable. That was actually you know in some respects it's surprising because quite often with you know engineering systems they they don't they don't behave as well as you'd like them to. So that was actually a very positive thing. I think that uh, the fact that the tra that it could be run for such an inexpensive cost was predictable. Um, I think that that becomes harder as the fee market goes higher and, and fees go up. Um, but 
the thing that I'm concerned about is that if you actually look at this and say, well, you know, if we went from, say, a one megabyte block to a, a two megabyte or four megabyte, eight megabyte, whatever, you are just sort of kicking the can down the road a little bit. You're not actually really making it dramatically harder. You can still cause stress to the system. If, if everybody's expectation is the fees are very, very low, um, the cost of the stress test of the 20 megabyte block size is not actually that high, but the potential consequences of having 20 megabyte blocks are sort of greater to the, to the network. Uh, the, 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 the risks are much higher because you have a much greater rate of um, orphaning. You end up with uh, potentially causing miners to change their incentives. Um, and I think this, this is one of the, the areas that's worrying and one of the reasons I think that you know, more modeling is actually required to, to, to actually make some of these changes. Um, and, then, and then, of course, there's the other question of you know, hard forks are something that are problematic at best. And, and really, do you want to start the whole ball rolling in terms of saying, well, we're going to accept making hard fork changes to the network on, you know, for, for, for unquantified reasons sometimes? Today's magic word is hash, H-A-S-H. Go to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. So next year, 2016, the block halving is going to take place. How does that come in here? So I think the... The, the block reward halving is, is going to be a very interesting time. If you look at the last one, um, so the one that's three years ago, very quickly after the block reward halving, the price of Bitcoins basically doubled against the, the US dollar. And so the effect was pretty much lost. Um, so yes, there's anecdotal evidence that some of the miners decided that it was no longer cost effective to mine and they shut down their mining, but the price of the coins went up and so the miners were still getting a significant amount of money and so we saw that hash rate sort of race away and, and you saw the whole development of ASICs. I think the next one is more tricky. I, I, the probability that the coin price will double seems unlikely. Um, and so then you get down to a question of what's actually incentivizing the miners. And I think that's unclear at the moment. Uh, I think beginning of last year, it was probably easier to predict that most mining was being done by sort of large or relatively large cloud mining infrastructures. Um, so you had you know, tens of thousands of people who were paying in to actually do, do mining activity. I think it's less clear how much of the network is currently mining that way now. Um, I think you have some big pools that it's not absolutely certain quite what they're doing or quite how they're, how they're going to operate. So the, the big question really comes down to costs. Um, mining ultimately is about you know, how do you convert electricity into hashes and, and gain the largest share of the total network. And the question you have to ask is, well, who can actually afford to run um, if the mining reward sort of drops to half of what it is right now? Because the, fee, the fees right now are pretty much insignificant. So if the, if the uh, re total reward in terms of, sort of US dollars halves, then it's going to be much more difficult for uh, some of those mining operations to continue. And we've seen this already. A large number of, of mining operations have shut down because it was no longer cost effective to mine. Um, and then you're left with people who potentially have different incentives for mining. Uh, so their, their reward is not necessarily in terms of it costs them X amount of dollars to, to, to pay for the mining and they, they get sort of X plus one from doing it. Um, you potentially have a situation in which some people can afford to mine at a loss because they're using it as a means of actually moving currency around other ways. Um, but I, I think that the whole question of what's going to happen with the next reward halving is, is very unclear. Um, yeah, in my view, it, it's not a, it doesn't sound like a good scenario it's coming up, right? Because uh, either we sort of keep going as, as we are today, right? So, and let's say we increase the block size. Mm -hmm. So of course that means that there's a lot of space for blocks and, and because miners are competing, the fees, the fees will not go up substantially, right? And that's great from a user experience point of view. It's, it's great from sort of also that story when it comes to adoption, you say, Bitcoin is fast, Bitcoin is cheap, 
Well, mm-hmm. right, that, those are some of the main selling points that we've been talking about for years to everyone and people. That makes sense to people. <laughs> and, and you can keep saying that then, right? But the problem is, right, then what you're saying, right? The hash rate drops in half. Uh, people turn off their manning hardware. Uh, and, well, someone, you can rent that hardware to attack it or it just right. becomes, so you have a security problem, right? And then I guess the flip side is you now leave it at one megabyte. You hope the transaction volume goes up and that then all of a sudden you start having people paying five milli bitcoins fees and some lightning network and somehow, and it, it seems very unlikely to me that somehow this is going to work. And all of a sudden we will then have this fee market that compensates. So yeah. I, I don't see there's any hope realistically of a fee market that compensates for the loss in mining rewards in 2016. I mean, there's just not enough time. I mean, we're talking 12 months. And unless there is an absolutely phenomenal increase in uh, transaction rates and, um, and, a, and a big change in the way people are prepared to fund those transactions, then I, I just can't see reaching sort of the fee level where you'd even get half of the loss in mining reward. I mean, you're talking about losing 12 and a half bitcoins per block as a, as a reward change. And that's, uh, that would be a, a staggering amount of fees. And of course, if you actually make the block size larger, then that, that fee market will never, never exist. I mean, it's just, there's no incentive to pay any fee if you don't need to. So one of the things you wrote on your blog is one thing that is clear is there will have to be changes in the way which mining is funded. Mm-hmm. What sort of changes do you have in mind? Well, I don't really know. I mean, I, I think that I mean, if you look at um, if you look at mining right now, there is a there's a tendency to centralize towards wherever the the energy costs the lowest. Um, those energy costs could be either you know you put them somewhere where you've got cheap geothermal power, or it could be somewhere where you can get cheap subsidized power, and and uh, I guess that's happening in some of the Chinese operations right now. But it's um, there's a tendency to do that. Um, I think that. The the funding of the network is going to be a, is going to be an interesting problem overall because you know when I wrote that, that those comments there was still a bit more time before you actually got to that reward halving as you get closer and closer to it the potential to actually change that and actually move towards a fee based model gets smaller and smaller um, so I think that you know unless there's a big speculative bubble and you see the price of bitcoins double there's going to be some significant amount of hash rate that has to be powered down. I mean, actually, the one, one thing that's been quite surprising is that there hasn't been a significant reduction in, in hash rates over the last year while the prices were dropping. Uh, I mean, people have been turning mining off, but actually other people have clearly been turning more mining on. Um, and so there has been a steady hash rate increase, um, some of which is going to be technology driven. But it's, it's actually surprising that there haven't been larger chunks of the network shut down. I mean, my guess is that people who've got the most efficient mining have kept it running so far. I don't find that so surprising at all. I mean, if people have the opportunity or think they have the opportunity to make money, they're obviously going to invest in it. Even, and, and I think most people don't understand you know, some of these um, very complex uh, sort of uh, models that we're discussing here and how they're going to play. Well, the, the you hope years. that the people putting millions into hardware do have some, some clue of what's going on. <laughs> well... Um, it may not be the case. But. May not be the case. <laughs> I mean, I, I think in some cases you've certainly got some miners now who've been around for a while, and they're making a long-term bet on the future of Bitcoin and a long-term bet on the fact that 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 investment is going to be worth something over the long haul, even if it's not necessarily making them money in the short term. I, I think they're making a bet that they they want to be doing this for for other other things in the in the future potentially. So uh, I recently read um, um interview with John Matonis, and one of the things he said there I thought was quite interesting. And he said that the sort of flip side of the idea of increasing the block size is changing the reward scheme mm-hmm. and basically questioning whether Bitcoin really should be limited to 21 million and whether we really should have that halving of the block reward every four years. Mm-hmm. Do you think, I mean, to me, it seems clear that politically there's just no way this is going to right. be touched. I think Bitcoin will crash and die and collapse before people will come to an agreement that that can be changed. 
I think so. So I mean, I, I think that the the majority of people who who've been mining and are holding substantial amounts right now are, are basing the fact that you know they know that there's a declining amount of bitcoins coming out in, in the future. Um, so they're assuming that what they invested in early on is going to be worth more over time because there's not new ones going to be coming on uh, becoming available. Um, I think that the bigger question really is about the nature of um, consensus within the Bitcoin network. Consensus both at a protocol level, but also consensus about what the core devs do and, and, and how Bitcoin as a system is actually allowed to evolve. Um, so, I mean, if you, if you start changing the reward structure, I mean, and I'd, I'd actually propose you know, changes just sort of half-heartedly, really. But if you start making those sorts of changes and accepting the fact that hard forks are okay, then where do you draw the line? You know, is it okay to define that the hard, there's a hard fork that says, well, we're not going to reduce the, the uh, mine reward or we'll change it so it's on a declining scale, so it steadily degrades off? Um, what other changes do you make at the same time? Um, and that, to me, I think is one of the, one of the bigger problems with um, this whole discussion about the block size. What what's the next one? You know, wh where where do you go next? Do you say, well, in nine months' time, if all of the large miners say, well, we're going to pull all our hashing on the day that the reward halves because none of us are going to make any money anymore, then do you have a knee jerk reaction that says, oh, we've got to change the mining reward structure? Uh, how should those decisions be reached? Well, I'm not sure that they can be reached. I think part of the problem is that uh, you have a design. It may not be perfect, but you know, making fundamental changes to it is actually very, very tricky. And I think that there's also a longer term question. Right now, we can actually have this discussion about making those sorts of you know, radical changes because the, relative, the number of nodes is relatively small and the complexity of those nodes is they're basically you know, servers and, and, and large PCs. So they're all basically the same. If you'd actually had a ragingly successful Bitcoin in which you'd had millions of embedded nodes that were all running full nodes as opposed to running anything else, you couldn't even have this discussion because vast amounts of the network would never accept the change. Um, and I think that that's actually one of the things that's unclear to me. It's, we're sort of able to have a conversation about changing it simply because it's not been massively decentralized. As soon as it becomes massively decentralized, then you can't make those sorts of changes anymore. And then the only option really is to evolve the value of the system to something else. And, and so rather than saying you change the nature of what Bitcoin is right now, you have a Bitcoin 2 or a Bitcoin 3 or whatever you want to call it, where you have a mechanism to actually move the value from the existing system into that next system, which has the different set of rules. And I, I guess that that's you know, a large amount of what the Blockstream guys are doing and the sidechains ideas is actually going to lead towards some of that sort of thinking. It will allow people to think about how can they move value from the existing system to something else. Part of the problem, I guess, is that everybody's sort of a bit nervous about um, you know, having to wait for those sorts of things to happen. But arguably, that is the safest engineering course would be to say, we'll keep it the, the design as it is. We know that there are some things we don't like about it, but we're working on approaches that will allow us to actually migrate things in different ways. But, but of course, it seems like if you do that, you're always just sort of kicking the can down the road, um, right? I mean, certainly true. I mean, but, but what, what at least you do get the ability to do is actually run meaningful experiments to, to work out what the next thing should look like. The, the worry with a, with a hard fork is that once you've made that, assuming that the majority of people actually accept it and that that hard fork sticks, then you now end up in a different situation and suddenly you've gone from um, an unknown, well, in a situation where you've got a relatively known problem to uh, a situation a bit further down the track where you have a completely unknown network and unknown incentives. And I think the worry there is that you know you need to do that analysis. And that's, that's one of the things that I haven't seen right now, which is surprising. There hasn't been that analysis of what actually happens when you migrate to that network. What, what does that actually look like? What, what, does, it, what does it mean? Um, certainly, it's going to delay the introduction of a fee market by having larger blocks. But does it actually introduce any vulnerabilities into the system? Um, does it mean that uh, potentially miners change their incentives? Um, I mean, right now, for example, most mining pools are accepting reasonably large blocks. I mean, the vast majority of them will take a, at least a 750 kilobyte block. 
out of the nominal one megabyte they can take, and some number take a full megabyte. But if you actually were to allow 20 megabyte blocks, uh, potentially that puts some number of them at a huge disadvantage, and they may actually just decide to actually artificially clamp the size of blocks they'll deal with to something much smaller, uh, because it actually makes more sense for them to, to run with a smaller size. So I, I think that, again, this is where there's some, some analysis needs to be done. So how optimistic are you that uh, all these things will somehow get resolved and there will be the, the good outcomes reached in, in all these different risks and scenarios and that we will be you know, here talking in five years about the Bitcoin that's now being used by 500 million people? So I think that there are, there's actually some other fundamental challenges, certainly if you want to get to 500 million people using Bitcoin. Um, the big challenge there is that even if you make the block size 20 times what it is right now, you still can't do that many transactions on it. So you're going to have to see things move to other sort of payment channels. You're going to have to have side channels of one form or another that will allow things to happen off the main chain. And I think that's actually the thing that's, that's potentially the most interesting. That's also where you get the potential for the most innovation. People can try ideas out and they can still use the main chain for actually moving the sort of bulk of value around. It loses some of the uh, decentralized sort of ideas. It loses some of the, the thought that this is completely uh, you know, completely trustless in the sense that you, you don't have to trust anybody. But um, I think for the vast majority of people, if you wanted to actually use the Bitcoin adoption, that's going to have to happen anyway. And we've already seen it. The, the exchanges effectively do that anyway. Um, so you have to put a certain amount of trust in, in somebody to do things the right way. So I think the potential there is for those organizations to become more transparent. So if you have to trust them, but you can verify that they've done the right thing, then that's actually a, a, a really interesting model. So what you're saying here is that so then Bitcoin becomes a, a settlement mechanism mm -hmm. and transaction gets... So one, one example of this is a Lightning Network of Force, which we've talked about on this show. Right. Do we get in a situation there? Where, because when I think about this, I, I have a difficult. I have. It's hard for me to to see how that would happen, so that we would have off chain transactions for the majority of transactions and Bitcoin being used as, as a settlement mechanism, and at the same time being able to use Bitcoin to do small transactions if you wish. So if you mm -hmm. want to be transparent and you want to be completely well, somewhat anonymous and um, and use Bitcoin for small transactions you could but it it seems unlikely that bitcoin would be able to be used as a clear as a settlement mechanism and also for just day-to-day -day transactions if one wishes to do so um doesn't that go sort of against the core principle principles of what bitcoin is so i i think that there's no reason why it has to be two different things i i think you certainly could have those micro transactions being handled uh via some other mechanism and then being settled on the main chain um, in fact, in some respects, it's easier if you do have that same unit being used to, for, for, for um, those transactions. But, um, I mean, certainly you have lost some of the decentralization at that point. So the question you have to ask is, from an end user's perspective, do they actually care about the decentralization so much or do they care about the transparency that the system gives them? Um, and, and does that allow them to do something in a way that they couldn't do with any previous sort of systems? And I think that the technology behind Bitcoin allows that. And I think there's a lot of people trying to work out how you can do those sorts of things. And you still do have the ability. There's nothing to stop you from, from actually making small payments using the, um, using the main chain if you wish to do so. It's just the costs associated with it may be higher. Yeah, but so that's so what I mean is then... Uh, I think that that would be un undesirable. If if you're stuck having to use some off-chain solution um, because the cost of transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain on the main chain is so high, mm -hmm. I don't think that's a very good uh, outcome for Bitcoin as a whole. So I, I, I think one of the bigger questions long-term is, you know, the, 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 there has to be a question of how do we align all the economic incentives. I think if Bitcoin had been able to stay on a very, very highly decentralized network where basically you were, uh, piggybacking on, a, on a, a vast number of people's compute power, then it's very, very easy to, to sort of say, well, okay, everybody's carrying some of the cost for the, for the, the, the network, 
and therefore everybody can take some benefit from it as well. It becomes more tricky when you end up with sort of the centralized mining infrastructures we have right now. I mean, they are, there's a lot of centralized mining effectively happening right now uh, because those guys are controlling the, the security of the system and they're also the ones who are you know, extracting most of the value from it right now because they're the ones taking the newly minted coins, they're the ones taking the transaction fees. So I, I think there's, there's some, some questions in terms of that, that mining infrastructure. Um, but I, I think for Bitcoin as, as a whole, I don't actually see that there's a huge problem with having uh, off-chain payment mechanisms, as long as those off-chain payment mechanisms can actually support the sorts of capabilities that the main chain itself supports. Uh, they, the only thing they potentially lose is some of the anonymity, uh, which I suspect for the vast majority of users isn't actually a huge deal. Or it could actually have more anonymity, you know, who knows, right? Right. I mean, with Lightning Network, potentially it has more anonymity. Um, one, of the, one of the things you mentioned when we were talking about topics before is uh, zero accepting unconfirmed transaction or that practice. What's your view on that? So I, I think that in the current network, zero, uh, zero confirmation transactions are, are worrying. Um, I think that, uh, that there was a certain amount of resistance to some of the recent software developments that have tried to make them highly unreliable. Uh, but to a certain extent, the genie is out of the bottle there. You know, once people realize that zero confirmation transactions are risky, there will be... But they're bad. not risky right now, right? They, well, they're not risky as long as the mining pools actually don't accept uh, replacement fees. And, and so, you know, double spends are something that would only be a problem if, if miners were prepared to say, ah, there's a bigger fee associated with this. So the replace by fee, for example, um, would potentially allow a double spend or even a triple spend of the same, same coins. Um, and so anybody who's receiving those is at risk if they actually try and do anything without waiting for a sufficiently large number of confirmations. But I think that that's actually a natural phenomenon that's going to happen. I mean, we've already seen with the spontaneous forks that happened not that long ago, you have mining pools that aren't actually running full validation and full verification of uh, transactions. So relying on the mining pools to actually do anything, I think, is, is questionable, um, at which point you have to, to argue that the whole idea of a zero confirmation transaction is is actually itself uh, highly debatable. Wait, can, just can you can you explain what you mean by mining pools are not doing full validation of transactions? So uh, there were some number of the mining pools who were basically doing um, SPV uh, verification. They weren't actually doing full verification uh, because they could gain a small advantage in terms of how quickly they could process things. Uh, and so we had, uh, I forget the exact date, but it was a couple of weeks ago, where uh, we, we had effectively a fork where um, certain mining pools weren't actually taking into account one of the, um, the new forms of transactions that could be, applied, uh, could be used. And so they were uh, effectively creating a second chain. And so, uh, but, but they, weren't bas they basically weren't running full nodes. They were running a lighter weight version of, um, of, of verification. So what are you suggesting for payment processors like BitPay and Coinbase and BitNet, etc.? Because it's a pretty miserable user experience, right? If you can't rely on so to a certain extent, on I, I, payments. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, 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 the trick is that with those guys who are acting as payment processors, um, to a certain extent, they, they have to take a judgment on the risk that's associated with doing it. So they might actually take take a, a view that the risk is small and there may be some heuristics they can come up with that actually measure what the real risk is. And this is another reason I think statistics are really interesting for the Bitcoin network. If those guys have good analysis of the actual real double spend attempts and they can see any patterns to those and they can see what the actual risk is, they can actually take a judgment as to whether they want to accept zero confirmation transactions or not. I think that the, the bigger risk is for anybody in general taking those zero conf transactions. Um, I mean, commercial entities can obviously make their own judgments about whether they'll accept them or not. Um, I mean, the, the other risk with zero confirmation transactions is really that um, if you look at uh, the original Satoshi white paper, 
there's a, an analysis there of what would actually be a, a safe number of transaction confirmations to, um, to, to get a certain confidence level about whether something can be reversed or not. And this is another area that, again, I think the statistics can help with where um, if, if your largest um, miner controls less than 10% of the mining hash rate and there's no collusion between miners, then you know, sort of six confirmations is great because you get a very, very low probability of six confirmations being overturned. Uh, if you have a situation where a miner is much larger, then the risk is that, that, that you need a, a dramatically larger number of confirmations to avoid or to get the same level of confidence that those transactions can't be overturned. And so I think that that's actually another area where potentially when you're talking about low confirmation rates, not necessarily zero, but, but low confirmation rate, uh, co confirmation numbers, you actually need to understand how centralized the network potentially has become. The more decentralized it is, the smaller numbers you actually need. Today's show is brought to you by our friends at Shapeshift. Shapeshift is the fast and easy way to trade altcoins. They now support over 40 of the most popular altcoins, including Flooring Coin, IO Coin, Positron, Infinite Coin, and so many others. When you want to trade altcoins, forget about using Exchange. That's so 2013, man. Just go to shapeshift.io and get it done in less than one minute with no counter sign up required. Their currency conversion tool makes trading altcoins just about as easy as using Google Translate. And we've also got some news for you. Shapeshift just put out an iPhone app. Here is my iPhone and here's the app uh, for the iPhone. It's an iPhone app for the iPhone. And you'd think that if you would make an iPhone app that then you'd use to exchange altcoins, well, you're gonna have to go to one wallet to send it to another to get the address then to Shapeshift to like execute it. You think that would be a pain and a lot of copying and pasting and stuff. Well, actually it wasn't, it was it's super easy. I put a little bit of Bitcoin in to get some gems in my uh, in my gems wallet, and it literally took like 30 seconds. So they, they've done an amazing job at that. So if you have an iPhone, do yourself a favor and download the app. If you are someone like Sebastian who uses Android, then do, do yourself a favor, throw away the Android, get an iPhone, and then download the app. So we would like to thank our friends uh, at Shapeshift for supporting the show. And, you know, go to shapeshift.io, give it a try. So you, uh, you work at Piranova, so you've been involved with uh, mining uh, at that company and mm -hmm. also worked in, in chip manufacturing. Um, can you talk to us about what, what, what you see as the future of mining? So I think mining is actually very interesting. Um, mining intrinsically is something that's going to burn a lot of energy. And so it has some, some implications because of that. Um, I don't know of anybody who's yet come up with a good proposal of how you avoid that as a problem. Um, I think there are some intrinsic challenges though for mining, which is that um, you, you really want to find a way where in some respects where you can actually uh, avoid it sort of running away and just consuming vast amounts of energy. That would be a sort of a desirable thing. I don't think anybody has a good solution to that yet, but I think that trying to find solutions to that would be extraordinarily useful. I and mean, if we can find a way of, of doing that, that would be a huge deal. I think the other challenge is if you want a network which is largely based on having a, a you know no centralized point of trust within it, there has to be some work done in terms of decentralizing the mining itself. And not, not actually the hashing. The hashing is the least interesting part of the, de the decentralization. There has to be... A, a big push towards decentralizing the transaction selection and transaction processing. So this is really down to the way the mining pools work, for example. Um, you, we, we really need to get to a stage where there are no large mining pools. Uh, and that may not be something that's possible within the current Bitcoin network. It may be possible. I mean, certainly it's possible with a hard fork, but I think hard forks themselves are problematic. Uh, but I think that's another area that needs to be looked into. Because if you could have a thousand pools, each of which control 0.1% of the network uh, and could be demonstrably not actually um, colluding in some respect, you have a much better decentralized network. Uh, the worry right now is that it's very easy for one miner to gain a very, very large share of the, the um, total hash rate. And, and it'd be very difficult for anybody to, to, to necessarily know that that was happening. 
one mining related story that has always gotten a lot of attention and it sounds uh, really exciting it has been 21 inc you no know, they've raised a ton of money and from what they've told it sounds like they will put miners in toasters and on the moon toilet seats <laughs> and, and 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 shoes perhaps who knows uh but no basically embedded in devices that has never made any sense to me. I, I, I don't understand it. Right. Uh, and, and you actually worked at Qualcomm, which is an investor in 21 Inc. What is going on with that? So I have no idea what Qualcomm were doing. Um, I actually know a bunch of people at Qualcomm who were really interested in Bitcoin for various reasons, but none of them, as far as I'm aware, were involved in those discussions either. The, um, I, 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 the idea of actually embedding the mining into lots of devices is great in one respect, which is that if, if you could actually couple that with decentralizing the mining pools as well, then it would give you a tremendous amount of decentralization. Um, but, but when you actually start to run the numbers, I don't think it adds up from, a, from an economic perspective, and I don't think it adds up from, a, from an energy perspective. Um, the energy in people's homes is usually pretty expensive. It's not like the hashing would be free. It's not like a byproduct of something else that's happening already. So I, I think that, you know, from a, from a global energy perspective, that doesn't make any sense. Um, and I can't see how the model at, uh, you know, where 21 provide the chips to go into all these embedded things, I can't see how that would work economically in anybody's interest anyway, apart from, you know, 21 potentially. Because in order for them to actually gain any transaction fees or gain, gain any mining fees from that, um, they're going to act, act as a huge pool. So 21 suddenly become the biggest pool in the network, uh, which doesn't seem like it's actually decentralizing anything. They've decentralized the hashing and centralized the control of that hashing. So that doesn't make sense either. Um, I mean, it basically sounds like they, their idea is to run a massive botnet. Right. Um, effectively, that's what it seems like. Um, and and it, it, I mean, it, it also makes very little sense in terms of um, you know, power and the devices that are actually naturally connected. One of the problems is that you need devices that are actually going to be connected well, and you need that to provide some utility to the people who are going to be powering that hashing. So, you know, it, it makes no sense to me to say you're going to be collecting a few sort of uh, few, few hundred Satoshis a day from your toaster. Because what are you going to do with them? There's nothing useful to do with this, that sort of smaller quantity. And also, your toaster's not networked right now. So from an end user's perspective, there's a huge problem, which is if you suddenly have to network your toaster, well, now you've gone from you know, your toaster, which is pretty unintelligent. You've now got to have a CPU in there. You've got to have a mining chip in there. You've got to design this thing so it can you know, connect to uh, something else. You've got to put Wi-Fi in there. And then... Uh, I don't know if anybody's actually spent a lot of time with Wi-Fi, but I used to work on Wi-Fi design. Um, and uh, there's an awful lot of Wi-Fi access points out there that will fall over if you put too many clients on them. So, you, you know, your, your toaster could be one device too far and suddenly your network stop work, stops working. So that's not a great end user experience. Um, you know, you put them in your refrigerator, well, the refrigerator is usually somewhere inaccessible, probably doesn't have great Wi-Fi coverage either. So these sorts of things don't really make a lot of sense. Um, and as a thought experiment last year, I was actually thinking about, you know, does it make sense to put these things into something like a router? As I used to design routers. It, on paper, that's the natural place to put um, sort of a, a, a hashing engine if you're going to do one. But then there comes a cost problem, which is uh, those devices are designed with a certain thermal footprint. They're not designed to, to go above a certain temperature. The enclosures are designed to run without fans. As soon as you start putting any sort of... Um, high energy consuming device in there those thermal device th those thermal characteristics go out the window you need more expensive enclosures and it suddenly starts to get more expensive to run so not only does it cost you more energy but it costs you more upfront as well so it, it, it just seems like it, it doesn't work as a concept so so is there there's no way you can think of that that their plans make any sense i keep trying i, I haven't found one yet but uh, you know good luck to them if they can find a way of doing it well, I mean, one interesting area to perhaps consider would be central heating. If you could have a central heating component in a house that you know, then distributes the heat uh, through a ventilation system, and you get some mining reward from that, um, would that sure. not be a, a good a good idea? 
Uh, sure. I mean, if, if you have something which already takes electricity and needs to generate heat, then that would make some sense. Uh, I, I think another one I heard somebody suggested was like greenhouse heating and things like that you know, for, for growing things. Those, those make sense because you're already turning electricity into heat in the first place. They're not necessarily the most, I mean, ASICs aren't the most efficient way of doing that, but you know, at least there is some value there because the intent was originally to burn energy to actually generate heat in the first place. But I, I think the, the question then becomes, is it the most efficient way? And, and would people sign up for that for large scale heating? Uh, and of course, even the, the, the issue, of course, is let's say people do sign up on a large scale for something like that. Well, I mean, the thing is with Bitcoin, of course, that would mean the difficulty rises and then the revenues would drop again. Right. So right. It, it, there seems to be like no way this, this makes any sense. Exactly. And unless, of course, you were to do a hard fork and say the 21 million cap disappears and you could now start having, right. you know, keep, keep collecting Bitcoins forever. But, um... So I want to ask you regarding the, the, the ASIC chips. So I, I believe we're getting towards the threshold in terms of um, what the, those chips are going to be able to produce in hash rates, like physical nanometers. Like I'm not especially... Uh, knowledgeable about chip manufacturing, but um, you mentioned in, in a talk that we were coming to that threshold. And also something interesting, you mentioned that um, in terms of energy savings, as we were getting towards closer to that threshold, the energy savings began to drop. So th does that mean that as chips continue to evolve, uh, they will be more expensive to run? And secondly, what comes after ASICs? Like, what comes after uh, we've reached that threshold and can't go any further? I, I think lots of people would like to know what comes after ASICs, uh, oh, starting with in, in, yeah. Intel and, and everybody else. Um, yeah, the 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 uh, if you actually look at Bitcoin, I, mean, I, I think I mentioned earlier, Bitcoin sort of raced through five generations of technology in five years, which was absolutely astonishing. Um, and you got to the stage where you have twenty eight nanometers or twenty nanometer devices which are pretty much state-of-the-art for what most people are using. Uh, there are a few now in 16 and, and I guess, 14 as well. Um, but those are, you know, at the moment, those are leading-edge devices. Uh, I think there has been some discussion of some research now that would take us down under 10. But, I mean, the, the, the amount of time to, to go through those generational gaps is getting bigger. It's, it's getting harder and harder for the scientists to actually come up with ways of actually shrinking things more than they have already. So every so often, you know, people say, oh, we're not going to get any smaller. And somebody always finds a way of doing it, but it, it's taking longer each time. So Bitcoin has reached the point where the ASICs are pretty close to the best they can do in terms of the geometry. I mean, yes, the geometries will continue to shrink. And, you know, as those technologies become available, you'll be able to use those for, for hashing as well. And that will certainly improve the power efficiency for that generation. Um, but you're then dictating the pace at which you can do things based on, you know, what the, the semiconductor fabs can do. And, and can they actually, um, can they actually produce anything smaller or more power efficient? So the other problem is that um, as these things get smaller, it used to be that you you'd sort of get this sort of square law gain where as everything halved in size, the, you know, sort of the power efficiency would go as a square of that. Um, that's not happening so much now. So that's actually pretty tricky. And the other thing is, if you look at a Bitcoin ASIC, it's, it's doing a fairly simplistic task. There's nothing too complex with it. Um, it's pretty well defined. There are some optimizations. I think most of them are already being taken. Um, you could certainly do some custom layout that's going to improve the power efficiency. And I'm sure the guys at 21 are looking at this uh, and others. So you can get some, some improvements there, but there's, there's a limit to how far you can take that. Uh, because what a Bitcoin ASIC does is already highly specialized um so i think that you you will see it uh, you know bitcoin at this point that the hashing will basically follow the same trends as sort of cell phone processors and and other cpus uh you're not going to see dramatic gains um and so this is one of the things i was i predicted uh, last year was that there would be a slowdown in the hash rate uh where the imp the the increases would now be pretty much dominated by just the pace of, of general technology and the replacement of previous generations of hardware. Um, so Bitcoin A6 then become sort of subject to the same uh, problems as the regular yeah, the, the, chip they've hit, they've manufacturing hit the industry. Yeah, they've, they've hit the limits of the physics right now. Okay. So uh, Dave, 
we're kind of at the end of our show. We've, we've, we've gone pretty long. Um, before we wrap up, so you work for Pure Nova. Is there mm -hmm. something like a few sentences uh, you can say about the company and maybe if people want to learn more about it, uh, where they can go? Sure. Uh, so, I mean, obviously, we, we started out in the Bitcoin space. Uh, we firmly believe that the technology that's used in, in uh, cryptocurrencies and crypto ledgers is extraordinarily useful. Uh, we have our own take on that. And so we've been working on some stuff that I guess we'll be announcing more in the next couple of months. Um, I, I think, unlike a few other people, we, we decided we didn't want to talk about it until we finished building it, or uh, at least you know, building, building a good working prototype. Uh, but we're looking at building things on a, on a different scale. Uh, so we're looking at how you can get the same sorts of um, guarantees and the same sorts of characteristics that you get with something like the Bitcoin network in terms of transparency and in terms of uh, the ability for somebody to verify that it's correct but apply those for other applications. So we're, we're looking at building sort of vast um, blockchain-like things, but without them being exactly the same as a blockchain. So uh, we have stuff up on our website now. In fact, we, we just changed the website slightly. There's a little bit more on there than there was before. Uh, and I guess we'll be announcing more in the next, uh, next couple of months. Cool. Thanks so much. And of course, we'll have links to this and also to your blog and, and to some of the articles we read in preparation all, all in the show notes. So, uh, Dave, uh, thanks so much for coming on. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so also some announcements. First of all, uh, I signed a job. So I'm going to be sort of a full time employee, I think, as the time when this, this podcast comes out. So I will be doing uh, business development. Uh, so I'll be the head of business development at Ares Industries. And uh, some of you may know that because we've had them on the podcast before uh, Press and Burn uh, a while ago. And well, I won't talk too much about it now. I'm, I'm really excited about it. I think it's a, it's a great company and a great, great technology. But uh, I'm sure I will talk about it more at, at some later stage. Uh, regarding Epicenter, you know, we'll keep doing this in the same way. So there shouldn't be any changes there. Um, and, and another thing is that, so we have decided since, since you guys have not been very, uh, not been very uh, good listeners in terms of leaving iTunes reviews, we have decided to resort to uh, the low act of bribing. Guerrilla tactics. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we have some of these t-shirts. So, so what we've decided is that once a week, if someone leaves reviews, we will give you, uh, we will send you one of t shirt and it can be negative review or it can be positive review. It doesn't matter. You can write whatever you want, but yeah. So if you want to do that, just send us an email at show at Epicenter Bitcoin, uh, with the sort of link or reference review and we'll send you a t-shirt or I believe we'll draw one a week. So if just like droves of you doing it then. Yeah. Of course, since we have no way of identifying you on, on, uh, on, uh, on iTunes, it's important that you send us the. You know, send us an email to let us know that you've written a review so that we can identify you. So, so that's show at epicenterbitcoin.com. And uh, by the way, th congratulations on your new job, Ryan. Yeah, thanks. I'm excited. Um, yeah, so thanks so much for joining us. So we put out new episodes of Epicenter Bitcoin every Monday. You can subscribe to the show in iTunes, SoundCloud, or of course, in, in whatever podcast app you use. And you can watch the videos on youtube.com slash epicenterbtc. And, and yeah, that's it. Uh, so thanks so much and we'll be back next week.